Welcome to Concordia Theological Seminary and our lectionary podcast for Proper 7, Series B. We'll be focusing on the Old Testament text for the day, which is Job 38, verses 1 to 11. This, is, uh, this section is frequently entitled the first, um, Yahweh's first speech. Now God, you know, we've already heard, we've got the history of Job, what's taken place. We had the visitation of his three friends and the one young man. And we have Job and the back and forth discussion between them and Job struggling through all of this, obviously. And then now, Yahweh, this is his first speaking uh, to actually address his first discourse in the book of Job. Now, it's really, truthfully, this is the moment that Job and his friends have been waiting for. They've been hoping that the Lord God will break his silence and set things straight, basically. Answer the questions. Reveal the why of what is going on in Job's life, his miserable life, truthfully. However, it is important to note that the why of what is going on in Job's life, well, the Lord does not answer that question. He doesn't answer any of the questions that Job and his friends are actually seeking the answer for. They're searching for these answers. They think they have them. They disagree. God shows up, and they expect him to sort it out, and he doesn't even bother with their questions. He does not answer them. It's not the ones they've been, what they've been wrestling with. He ignores Job's complaints, ignores Job's, claim, Job's claims of innocence, he refuses to support the accusations of Job's friends. He just does not go there. And that disappoints Job, his friends, I'm sure, and it disappoints the readers of Job even today. You know, Job as a book is where most Christians turn to in the hope of finding the answer to suffering. They also seek to understand the Lord's uh, role or power in all things, especially in this, when we suffer strings, the slings, rather, and arrows in this life. The term frequently used is theodicy, which is basically an apology for God in the face of evil. What is God doing? What can God do? When will he do something? What is he trying to accomplish? Why does he allow? Why does he put up with? Why does he bring suffering? Why does he give suffering? These are heavy and difficult questions. And of course, the first place that man tends to go for the answer is what we call retribution theology. Good things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. So if bad things are happening to you, well, you've done something bad. That's the argument of Job's three friends and even of the young man Elihu. Job, you must have done something terrible. You must have done some terrible thing to be in the midst of this kind of suffering. Oh, boy. And eventually, after a long struggle with his friends and with the suffering itself, well, Job falls himself into the same trap because the Scripture clearly shows retribution theology is nothing other than works righteousness. Do good, and God will love you. He'll bless you big, bring you to heaven, do bad, and it's H-E double hockey sticks for you, both on earth and in the bowels, actually, the bowels of Sheol. Human nature first turns that direction, but God turns us back, just as he's about to do to Job in our pericope. Truthfully, maybe disappointedly, Job, the book of Job does not answer any of our questions concerning these things. Neither does Yahweh in his address to Job. Job. The fact that the Lord answers Job at all is really quite frankly a gift of love, of mercy, a gift of grace. But he does provide, but he does not provide the answer that Job's seeking. 
Instead, rather, he teaches him about the relationship between God and man. That's what he tells him. Who is who God is and who man is, and who are they in relationship to one another? So Yahweh's address here basically begins by saying, You wish to question me, Job? Stand up, gird your loins. I have some questions for you. It's doubtful that this is the direction that Job was hoping the conversation would go. So as we look here at verse 1, and we have 11 verses to skate through here. A lot of very difficult, by the way, a lot of very difficult um, Hebrew here. We'll do our best here getting through it in a timely fashion. But right here in verse 1, then grammatically we see the, it's not marked that way on this particular translation, but in your, if you have your Stukartensia or your readers, you'll see it marked with, uh, here, let me do that different here for you. Well, let's just um, try that. You have the K and the Q. Now, the K stands for K-Ray, and the Q is Kethiv. And K-Ray is basically from the Hebrew word kara, to call or to say. Um, and Kethiv is written, how it's written. I got these, uh, it's actually K-Ray and Kethiv, for those of you keeping score at home. The, what happens here is there, there is a, uh, I won't call it a scribal error because we don't know that. But this word here, as you notice, it's not pointed, but somebody, either accidentally or on purpose for some reason, has put two words together in a way in which they're not supposed to work together. And so... The people who are reading this, as they read it, as it is written, but they were saying, if I'm going to say it out loud, I'm going to do it like, I'll put it in parentheses how it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be two different words, men, from, and then the, the, uh, has, the hasa'ara. So uh, what we would call... It's translated a few different ways. The, uh, it's either translated as, we would say whirlwind frequently. You probably hear that much as any. Uh, but it can also, somehow or another I messed that up. Oh, there we go. But it can also mean um, tempest. So whirlwind or tempest either. Uh, but that's really, the, that's where we see the Kethiv Kere. They, and in this case, uh, it doesn't change the meaning whatsoever. It just makes it very peculiar to see, and even it, it uh, might affect the pronunciation a little bit too, making it a little more uh, complicated, if you will. So we have out of or from, really from the whirlwind or from the tempest. Now, you may have noticed in Scripture that... Um, the whirlwind or the tempest happens to be the origin of uh, many theophanies in Scripture. Elijah, as he's hiding in the cave, we see also Elijah and his being taken up into heaven by a whirlwind. We also see this in Nahum, chapter 1. We see it in Zechariah, chapter 9. So this idea of the... Um, of God speaking out of something like the whirlwind or the tempest. I mean, you could, you could discuss the glory cloud on Mount Sinai, the thunder and the earthquake and all that too, all these different ways. But certainly, there, that when the whirlwind and tempest shows up, pay attention, God's there to say something. He's going to reveal something either by word or by... A, uh, a vision or a pre-incarnate 
uh, angel of the Lord moment, uh, whatever it might be, but we see this a lot. Okay, moving on to verse 2 then. The mash, the mach shik, the mach shik, right up here. The root, the root here is the um, uh, chashak, and it's a hifel form, and it means to obscure or to make dark. You can see you have this nice darkeneth here, but to obscure or to make dark, or to darken. I think that works uh, pretty well. And the idea of the etzah that follows right after it, or the etzah rather, the etzah that follows right after is like plan or counsel or, um, yeah, probably the, one of those two. Uh, so who is it that darkens my my counsel, or dark, uh, really literally, let's see if I can do this, I would probably say it's, it's best to say, who is it that darkens counsel? And then we end up with by or with, you know, his uh, words without knowledge. You know, here's our word for knowledge here. Okay, now, in these, um, in these first words here, uh, it's important to know and remember this, because I, I know we, there is this opinion it's incorrect. I used to have this opinion myself, and I've learned that it's incorrect, but this idea that Job has not sinned, that Job has been perfect, that Job, that Job uh, in his defense of himself, has eventually now, actually in reality, has sinned. He has fallen into the trap of the same uh, bad theology of his friends. He has slipped, and of course, he's been worn down by his friends and all of that, and we can certainly understand how that can happen, but we should not say that Job is uh, without fault here. Job has darkened counsel by words without knowledge. In other words, Job has screwed it up, okay? And now he's demanding that God acknowledge that he's okay, or that he's right, or something to that effect. And God says, oh, you, you don't understand my ways? Well, let's, uh, you want to know what's going on? Well, let's check out your, uh, your knowledge first, and you answer questions for me, and then we'll, we'll decide. Uh, so, in this first part of the discourse, then, this is, um, we only have these first 11 Verses. It goes on for quite a while, but this first part really focuses a lot on um, as God as creator. You get creation, creator language here. Uh, as we get to like verses 25 to 38, for instance, you really see him specifically presenting himself as Lord to um, that aspect, that, to Job. But here it's creator. That's what we're looking at, God presenting himself as creator. So we get the girding up here to, uh, to gird up. The idea of girding up, you know, you gird up in the, um, you gird your loins. In this case, I'd say like a, a young man is probably better or a strong man or even uh, someplace a mighty man. But you gird your loins in order to do battle. When you go into battle, you gird your loins. Or when you uh, enter into a wrestling match, you gird your loins. It, what it does is it frees up your movement so you don't trip over your robes, so to speak. Uh, there's a couple places where I think it's, I believe it was Elijah, uh, where he girded up or gathered up and he ran ahead of King Ahab and ran and beat him back to the city. 
but it talks about him girding up his loins in order to do it. Um, it's just how, this is kind of just language uh, that sometimes I'm not sure we understand exactly what's going on there. Um, but you might imagine that when, if God says to you, get up on your feet, gird up your loins, and you know that means to do battle or to enter into a wrestling match or whatever, and it's with God, this, this may not be, uh, this might cause a little fear a little intrepidation in one's heart, um, and I'm certain it must have done that for Job. So now we have here at the end of this verse, the wa, waho, waho di eni, very interesting one, but this is a, an imperative form. It's actually a Hiphel imperative from Yada, um, meaning to, in this, this particular case, you know, from Yada to know, but the um, make me know. I think uh, you can see they translate this as declare thou unto me. Make me know. You know, let me, show me what you know. Make me know. So we go to verse 4, and we talked about this last, last week, the fo from I, where. Then we have the, um, the um, biasdi. The biasdi. This is kind of a, a little bit of a Strange word comes from yasad. Uh, it means to found or to establish. And uh, and then the a word you probably know, but we probably should point it out, the vina understanding. So um, this becomes a kind of an important underlying theme here. What do you know? What do you understand? Don't you understand these things? Why not? If you have enough gumption, enough, uh, hmm, we'll just use gumption. If you have enough gumption to question me, the Lord God, Job, you would do that and you don't even have enough, you don't have this kind of understanding, you know, that kind of idea that kind of goes through this whole text. So uh, then moving on then to uh, verse 5, and we have that, uh, Oh, that phrase here, yeah. Mem, memadeha, which is from memad. And the memad here means to measure or to trace out or a measurement, if you will. So um, take, uh, pay close attention here as this is going on. It sounds like, you know, um, you're, you're laying out... Um, foundations, you're stretching out the line, basically um, a measuring line, all that. You, you certainly are going to get pedestals and bases coming up here. Um, all of this language uh, sounds like we're building something, right? Like a construction language, we, we might say today. So um, verse 6, let me move this over for us. Give us a little more to work with. Okay. Now, on this, uh, beginning at verse 6 then, we see again some more, uh, they translate as foundations. Uh, it might be better, Adenyena, really from Eden. The root uh, might be better to think of it in terms of, I think when we think foundations, we think of a whole foundation around a house that the house sets upon. But in this case, uh, it's probably more like a pedestal or a base, maybe a column. 
a buried column. I mean, we do, we do that kind of construction as well and use that as a foundation, but it has that kind of sense of a pillar, pedestal, base upon which it sets. Um, and then we have this very, uh, another very interesting word, the hot, the hot, the hot bow even sounds interesting. Here we go. The hot bow actually is, um, uh, it's a strange form of huffle, a whole fall, I really should say, which is the passive of the hip fell, as you probably remember somewhere along the line. And this passive, it means to be sunk or to be settled, to be planted. Again, notice the passive sense, to be, here. It was. And then we have um, pinatha, up here, meaning uh, corner. You know, Evan, Evan, pinatha, uh, we would call that cornerstone. Evan, meaning, is the one for, uh, for stone. You're familiar with that one, uh, like uh, the Hebrew word Ebenezer, or Ebenezer, meaning stone of my help, very messianic, of course. But um, the Evan here, the stone, the cornerstone, which is also fairly messianic uh, in many places in Scripture. So, we keep going here down to verse 7. We have the Baran from the root Rana. This one, and uh, meaning it means to rejoice, to give a, a, a ringing cry, uh, sometimes a cry or a shout of jubilation. It's a happy thing, not a shout of terror, but a cry of jubilation. And uh, then we have the Hiphel here of Ruah. Somewhere, where is that? Right over here. This is the Hiphel form, and the Hiphel here is another rejoicing term, meaning to shout in triumph or, or to cheer, rejoice again. So God begins his questioning here to Job using the language of construction, like we said, as in the building of a building. God had a plan. He implemented it, but no man, certainly not Job, was there to bear witness. And the reference is very clear, and I'm sure Job got it easily. How can you question the Lord when you do not have knowledge? Job undoubtedly is hearing that message loud and clear right now. So, continuing on here for our next uh, few verses, verse 8. The rest of our text here now is going to change. We've been building here. Well, now we're going to talk about the sea the yom, and we're going we're gonna to deal with the, uh, if you will, the, in the sense, and I think the reason the sea is used here by the Lord is the sea is uh, one of the original, if not the original element of the world, as we see in Genesis 1, verse 2. It's unfathomable, frightening, um, and, it, and, and even in Job's time, the sea is very uh, frightening, unfathomable. Uh, these are not sailors, the Hebrews. They don't do that. And so, so to them, the sea is kind of like the haunt of Leviathan and things like that. There's, there's a lot of weird stuff out there. We don't know anything about it. We're very, they're terrified, basically, of the sea. So God brings up the sea, and then he, he talks about it in a way that that shows the sea is absolutely obedient to him. The sea answers to him. It does what he says. In fact, we're going to get this, uh, this sense where the sea is as a, as a child to him. That's coming up here. But I do think it's interesting to make this connection uh, that when Jesus in, in, the, um, in the New Testament calms the Sea of Galilee, this speaks a rather large uh, message to the people who see that, who witness it, to the disciples. Uh, it shows his power. So, um, but
But here we have this language on the C, and we see the, uh, have the, uh, the, the wa yashak here. This uh, meaning to, to shut in, to contain. He has shut up. Um, it, it's kind of got this idea, um, yeah, shut in. There are boundaries. God sets the boundaries for the sea. The sea can't go anywhere. He won't allow it to go. He, he, is, he has power over even the sea. And then this idea, this begecho, here in the same verse, talking about the bursting out. In this case, it's broke forth. Notice here, though, the womb language. This is, um, this is where we pick up a few words that will, that will give us or help us to understand um, how to God the sea is but as a mere child, that he can control the sea, that he, he sets its boundaries, everything. It is as a child to him. So when you go down to the next verse, you see the swaddling band. I think it's translated here, and that's a, that's a fine enough, a fine enough translation or swaddling bands. The kalthula, a very fun word to say. If I can find it, it means to. Um, It, it's uh, swaddling band. It means that encircling band. But the idea of the swaddling, you see, is that if you remember swaddling clothes, the wrapping up. And it has, again, that infant kind of language. Uh, the cloud is the garment. And the darkness is the swaddling band. So, again, you get this idea of, of a child, of, even of, as an infant, of a, of a baby. The sea is like that, and that God has wrapped it up. That God has wrapped up the sea. Uh, it's complete submission to the Yahweh. And uh, let's go ahead and jump down to verse 11 then, uh, where the Lord God says, Yep, we're on here. If I can get it, I think this is the one we want. This phrase right here, this idea of, again, God setting boundaries. Uh, the idea is that, of course, the uh, ufo yashith big on galeka. And here, shall thy proud waves be stayed and no further here shall your proud waves or even waters be stayed or here they will break and the idea of the breaking is as as the waves break on the shore they stop there and the lord god has determined where they can go again god is showing his power uh, and and uh, laying that out before job just to remind Job of who he is, really. Now, our reading ends here, and the question will continue for quite a while. And Job, of course, will have no answers to any of these questions of the Lord God. So you have to ask, why does the Lord God even bother to show up and question Job? Well, the Lord's teaching Job, teaching him concerning who he is and who the Lord is, what the relationship is to one another, as we said, and that's the most important thing for Job to understand, really. Job would like to understand the nature of suffering, or his own suffering at least, but the most important thing for Job to understand is the relationship, not the suffering. God bless your preaching.